Nowhere was this intervention clearer than in a battle for Madrid. Until October, the skies were dominated by the rebels, reinforced by German and Italian planes. The Spanish Republican Air Force was no match until Soviet planes arrived. Just before the Soviet aid arrived, I had seen a demonstration of women marching along the Gran Via, the principal street in Madrid, shaking their fists at the German and Italian planes and shouting, no passeran, they shall not pass. Two weeks later, there was another flight of planes over Madrid. This time they flew very low and dropped no bombs. Everyone looking up from the streets suddenly saw that they were no longer Germans or Italians, they were Russian planes. And the cry went up that ran right through the city, son nuestros, son nuestros, they're ours, they're ours. One day we were surprised to see some new machines in the sky, and we saw these small ones with snub noses. They flew around at a tremendous speed and shot down a nationalist plane occasionally. People began to get excited, started shouting, Long live Russia! They started to hug each other. Just 15 weeks after the start of the war, the Republic's capital, Madrid, was on the front line. The rest of the Republic lay behind. The army rebels held the territory north and west of the capital. Their land offensive began on November 7th. With only 25,000 men, the nationalists were attempting to capture a city of one million inhabitants. Franco had made ready lists of people to be arrested. Having met little resistance so far, he could not have anticipated the stubborn reaction of the Madrid people. No passeran, they shall not pass, had become the slogan of Madrid, and indeed of all Republican Spain. The government on the Lago Caballero left the capital for the safety of Valencia. So did many of the population. For those who stayed, some preparation to defend the city had already been made. General Miaka, one of the army officers who stayed loyal to the Republic, led the defense junta in charge of the overall political and military control of Madrid. Miaka and his staff officers were joined by Communist Brigade Commander Enrique Lista. The population had been prepared politically to receive the enemy with boiling water, with oil, with anything that came to hand from their balconies and roofs. The defense of Madrid was more thanks to the people of Madrid than to the militias. People joined up at once. They didn't even bother to go home. They were given some hand grenades and a rifle, and with their ordinary jacket and trousers, they got into waiting vehicles or into a tram and went off to fight. This was really striking and wonderful. It was one of the most wonderful moments of the war. Everyone in Madrid was involved. Loyal officers staffed the army. Ordinary people built defences for the city. Political parties recruited men for defence militias. But most of all, an organised army was created. However barely trained and equipped, ten new brigades of the popular army of regular soldiers, mixed with volunteers, were naturally a more effective fighting force than the old militia columns. The people's resistance was stiffened by the approach of Franco's troops and by potent propaganda. No olvides Madrid la guerra, jamás olvides que enfrente los ojos del enemigo te echan miradas de muerte. Rondan por tu cielo halcones que precipitarse quieren sobre tus rojos tejados. 
tus calles, tu brava gente. Wir entfernen Vaterland geboren, nahmen nicht als harten Herzen mit. For two generations, the Spanish Civil War has been remembered for the international brigades. This fighting force of 40,000 men was a unique expression of international solidarity. There were Frenchmen, Greeks, Poles, Italians, Americans, Canadians, Irish, Czechs, Australians, Swedes, Swiss. There were 2,000 British. 500 of them died. But the war was already four months old, and Madrid under siege by the time the first organized volunteers arrived in the city to take up positions at the front. One of the first battalions was predominantly German. It was named after Ernst Tellmann, the leader of the German Communist Party who was in a Nazi concentration camp at the time. They took us straight to their hearts. They knew why we'd come. They had one slogan for us all, long live Russia. They treated us as if we were Russians, but only slowly they got to realize we were Germans. So far, Madrid had been bombed by Germans, the Condor Legion, and now suddenly, there were Germans on their side. With a background of military service, a life of resistance to persecution that bred political discipline, these German communists were an example to the Spanish. For me, seeing them brought the joy of solidarity, the warmth. They left a profound impression on them. Also, they showed us the things we had to learn, what discipline is, what an army is. Until then, we'd been a militia, not a regular army. Not all Republicans were so happy about the volunteers. In Catalonia, some anarchists feared their revolution was being taken over by communists. They arrested a party of international brigaders arriving from France. But in Madrid, everyone was grateful for any relief from the enemy. The international brigaders were rushed up to the front to help their Spanish allies resist the rebel army attack. There was fighting in the Casa del Campo, a park on the western edge of the city. On November 15, 1936, the rebels finally broke through Madrid's defences at a point in the university campus overlooking the park. The international brigades held the line in the philosophy faculty, but two days later the rebels attacked again and occupied part of the clinical hospital. The Tellman battalion found themselves defending one floor of the hospital from the moors on the floor below. We were on the third floor. We'd knock holes in the ceiling, and then we'd throw hand grenades down to clear them out. In this fight, there was hardly ever a real front, a front which was clearly defined. Eventually, the line stabilized, and Madrid held out. So Franco tried a new tactic. The Civil War became a testing ground for modern weapons. It was a foretaste of what was to happen a few years later in London, Hamburg, Tokyo and Leningrad. But until now, no city in history had been so sorely tested.